All right, so welcome back to Debrek. It's now 35 minutes past uh, 6 o'clock. That's 25 minutes to 7 o'clock. Um, welcome back to the show that uh, we want now to discuss some of the matters that have been affecting the country and specifically the state of the war because we know that the coronavirus now is on week 9 or 10 and uh, it, the numbers are still rising. We just want to take a look at that before we can speak to the government spokesperson that is um, Sarah Zoguna. He's already online but before that let's take a look at some of the numbers that we know so far. Uh, the cases, this is the state of the war. The total infections are 887 and out of these 313 have recovered, those that have died are 50, and therefore the active cases are 524. And uh, apart from that, what we know is that uh, this has been the Kenya's worst week in, when it comes to coronavirus disease. That is the week up to uh, yesterday, the 17th of May, because uh, a week ago we had 672 cases. Now we're at 887, meaning that the increase has been 215 and the new deaths that have been recorded this week have been 18. That's the worst um, in, as far as this is concerned. So let's take a look at uh, how the numbers have been rising. You see, the first 10 days of coronavirus, we had 15 cases. The second week, we went to 27 then 100, 100 um, during the third week. Then that went down a little bit to four cases. And then after that, it has been a consistent, a consistent rise from 73 in the fifth week, 85 on the sixth week, 110 seventh week, 207 uh, last week. And now this week has been 215. So you can see how the numbers have risen. I was hoping that it would stay there for longer. But now let's take a look at some of the measures that have been taken by the government. For instance, there's the national curfew uh, since the 26th of March. This was 13 days after the first case of coronavirus was announced. Um, that curfew was declared for an initial period of a month. Then that was extended by 21 days. And this was extended on Saturday again for a further 20 one days and therefore that means uh, that uh, it continues until the 6th of uh, June. Now what we know also is that uh, the schools have been closed since the 16th of March. Th this was three days after the first case was announced and uh, the opening has been suspended. The schools were to resume on the 4th of May 2020. That was suspended to 4th of June but at the same time there's a committee that is looking at uh, the modalities of reopening the schools bearing in mind that uh, the institutions will also have to take care of uh, situations uh, with them um, safety and health of the learners as well as the teachers that are in schools. Then restaurants operations have been restricted. You recall that uh, previously um, there were no sitting clients that had been allowed to be at, at restaurants or eateries but then again uh, that was lifted a few weeks ago and said that uh, all operators of restaurants and eateries will have to go through testing to ensure that they are COVID-19 free. Then also what we know is that the international flights have been suspended um, as early as uh, towards the end of uh, Martin. So that's just, just like the situation. Of course, there's many other things that have happened, but to speak to us this morning is um, Colonel Cyrus Zoguna and um, Richard Colonel, that is, so, so to speak. So good morning, sir. And um, as we look at uh, the state of the war, where do you, what, what would be your assessment as the government continues with the intervention measures that we see now? Of course, uh, many Kenyans having taken a hit from all what is happening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sam, for uh, inviting me to the show. Our assessment really is that uh, the situation is still not very you know, uh, appealing uh, because, as you have rightfully said, we are seeing that uh, infections are actually growing within the community. And, and uh, you know, as our people, we, all we have to do is to ensure that uh, those advisories that the government has been able to issue mm -hmm. are directly and are strictly followed. That is what we suggest and we keep on appealing to Kenyans that if we are to bring down the number of infections, mm -hmm. then we must strictly adhere to those or else they will continue to rise. But I also would wish to add that I uh, realize that we've also ramped up our testing mm -hmm. because for the first time we were able to test of 2,000 plus, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, the, in the, the day before yesterday. And as you test more, certainly the number of those that are, you know, uh, uh, positive uh, with the corona will mm -hmm. likely go up. And that is why we uh, 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 believe very strongly that this disease is firmly now within our communities. Right, and so when you look at this, obviously one would be um, forgiven for assuming that if you had to talk about it, the, the, the 26th of March when the first curfew was announced, most of the cases that have now turned positive were most likely negative at that time. Do you think the measures that the government have uh, taken or put in place have been effective in controlling the spread, despite the numbers that are now rising? If, 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 yes, yes, the measures have been very effective. Now, I explain to you. 
If you look at the cases that are coming up, those cases are largely confined within Nairobi and Mombasa. Mm -hmm. And these other outlying counties have, are reporting very minimal cases. Mm -hmm. Now, if those measures had not been put in place to restrict movement out of these counties of Nairobi, Mombasa, Kilifi, the situation right now would be completely different. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, therefore, these measures have been very effective. Mm -hmm. And obviously on, on, on the screen you will see that um, the borders uh, that have been closed is between Somalia and Kenya as well as Tanzania um, Tanzania and Kenya. And uh, the measures that are announced by the president are that this is to ensure that uh, the traffic that is flowing into the country is controlled. I mean, how effective will that be despite the fact that cargo transportation is to continue? Yeah, cargo transport is, they have to continue because again, you know, the economy must run. That, that you know, is something that uh, we... Uh, must you know keep a sight of but then uh, if you are not to be able to restrict movement in and out of you know our borders with those countries remember that uh, some of the, those countries do not have any you know restrictions in as far as certain activities the countries are concerned mm -hmm. and therefore some of our people are also moving in and out you know using various um you know closing points both official and unofficial closing points and therefore this advisory or restriction that have been issued are to ensure that movement of any other, you know, um, activity other than for, you know, cargo mm -hmm. is restricted. And that is to ensure that uh, those that will be moving either in or out, the numbers are completely restricted. It makes it easy to, you know, attest, it makes it easy to trace, and it makes it very easy now to to find, to find out where the, you know uh, who are infected and and therefore contain the infection within those individuals. Mm -hmm. And l let's take a look yes. at um, some of the measures that uh, the government has has put in place and require enforcing, especially by the police. There has been allegations that um, some people are using the panya routes first. Secondly, people are using the official uh, blockage or barricades that we have at, at different positions, but then. Um, buying their way into or out of the, the, the four uh, counties that have experienced the cessation of movement. How true is this and how are you dealing with it to ensure that only the people that need to travel in and out of these four, five counties are getting access? Uh, the first one that you did mention about people using an official panel routes mm -hmm. and indeed the police cannot be everywhere really. Mm -hmm. They cannot be in every tree, they cannot be in every river valley, and that's why the CS help consistently say that this requires high level of discipline. We must be, as a people, be disciplined because this is not to protect the police, it's not to protect the government, it's to protect all of us. Mm -hmm. And for those that moved on, it also did give, yeah, the other day, even the head of state did give, you know, an, ex a, you know, an explanation, even a story about somebody who moved all the way, you know, into um, a, a region in, in Okambania. Mm -hmm. Only to infect his very close relatives. Mm -hmm. You see, now that is not necessarily somebody can, you know, dump him, himself in the chest and say that he's a hero, really. So going around these established crossing points that you feel that you have been able to achieve much, only to end up infecting your very close relatives, mm -hmm. is actually the worst form of indiscipline that anybody can exhibit. And many of our people, not many, but few of our people have been able to do that. And we are trying to, every now to appeal to them that you must be able to protect yourself and those who are close to you because that is how you can be able to demonstrate love to them. Mm -hmm. But indeed, the police cannot be everywhere. It takes us as a people, us as a society, to help in terms of enforcing some of these regulations. The question now, of... The second uh, question... The, the reason I'm asking that question is because we've seen cases spreading to other counties. We'll talk of the case in uh, Bomet of that uh, patient that died of COVID-19. There are so many others that have had to cross over outside of Nairobi, including uh, the suspects that had been um, taken to KMTC in Nairobi. They found their way out of Nairobi into Kericho. I mean, how is this happening at a time that police are manning these um, established crossings, as you call them? And that's exactly my point. I'm saying that there are those who are actually using pioneer routes, and there are those that, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you must also appreciate that uh, within our community, there are those that may not be very, very, you know, uh, honest, mm -hmm. even as we man some of this, but not all, maybe just one or two or three, but largely the police have done a fantastic job to get us where we are today. But indeed, you know, uh, not everyone of us 
you know, it's, it's like I did mention, is very honest. Uh, and those who may be dishonest, and they, may, and they are very few. In fact, if anything, I think like 9.9% of uh, members of the police are doing a fantastic job. But maybe one or two right. who may not be as, 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 as honest as the ma majority of others may sometimes pull the good name of the police. But okay. largely, most of them are doing a fantastic job. Okay, all right. Maybe we will never know what really happened that those uh, patients were able to cross out of Nairobi. But let's focus on a story that we ran last night and also this morning that is asking where the food is. A few weeks ago, we saw the Cabinet Secretary for Interior Affairs, Dr. Fred Matiangi, uh, flagging off some food for Mukuru, Kwa Jenka, Mukuru, Kwa Ruben. But understandably, now the residents are saying they have not seen the food. Would you know the status of the distribution of this food and who exactly is handling this process? The food that, uh, you know, it was yesterday you highlighted, is, I, I do recall, and the, the truth is that that food is not been distributed. It was flagged off, but because of logistical issues, it will be distributed within the next, you know, uh, two, three days. For those who have not been able to get food, they must be rest assured that in a couple of days, maybe one or two, the food will be able to, to reach them. So what is that very big challenge that you'd flag off a food, but weeks later it's not... Logis it logistical issues would mean coordination, would mean uh, identifying the various, you know, households that may be quite food, because that food is not given to everybody, even those that are able. So you uh -huh. must be able to map out to the various households that are in need, and then after identifying that, then you distribute the food. So there are others that have been able to receive, the others because of, like I did mention, logistical issues, it is yet to get to them, but certainly it will. So what is that process of identifying who, who fits to be given that food? Because you know, the, the process of identifying starts from the ground. You know, uh -huh. the various local headmen, the Nubakomis, so they must be able to move from house to house, from household to household and be able to determine who really Launch is needed. Launch of the program at KICC, interior CS, Dr. Fred Matia. Any howling, mm -hmm. it will not be able to get those needy families. Mm -hmm. so it takes a bit of time to be able to map out that. So you said that the food will be distributed in the next three days. Is it because you have now finalized the process of identifying these people and mapping out how you're going to do it? There are several coordination efforts that must be undertaken, and like I did mention, you don't, just don't want to go give out food, and therefore you end up with the same situation that uh, happened in Kibera a month or so ago. So you mm -hmm. must identify and put logistics in place so that when that food is distributed, it's in an orderly fashion, and that uh, it, it achieves the intended you know, objective that uh, was you know, uh, identified from the very word core. Mm -hmm. And obviously, yeah. um, spokesperson, the bigger challenge now is for families and households on how to sustain themselves at such times, bearing in mind that some of them have lost jobs. There are people that have been asking that um, the COVID-19 fund has been receiving donations, of course, some of them being in terms of food and non-food items, but at the same time, uh, cash um, donations. How is this being managed and how soon will we start seeing the impact, especially of the cash uh, donations that have been coming through? Yeah, but cash, remember the... The, the, the uh, COVID fund has got a secretariat. Mm -hmm. And like I did mention, really, you, you don't get funds or support and then you give it out immediately. There is a procedure in giving out something. And that procedure is, like I did mention, that you must be able to map out. Remember, you know, mapping, we have, we have, we've got about you know, several millions of Kenyans who have been affected by this COVID situation. Mm -hmm. They are dispersed all over the country. Mm -hmm. and. and you know, mapping out in an accurate manner to identify really who is, should be, you know, who should benefit from this support and who should not, right? Mm. That takes a bit of time. So really what we can ask our people to be a bit more patient as mechanisms and infrastructure is put in place to ensure that whoever gets that support is the person who needs it. Of course, one would understand that uh, you need time to identify the rightful beneficiaries, but at the same time, these people are waiting. They are hurting already. What are the uh, mitigation see, factors? Are, yes, uh, I know that that is a, is a concern. The government is concerned about that, and that's why this process is being expedited to ensure that uh, you know, they don't wait any longer. Additionally to that, there are also other you know, um, support systems that have been put in place by county government that is also uh, providing assistance to them, really. So what is provided by national government is just also to supplement mm -hmm. what has been put by the county government. So there mm -hmm. are two levels of assistance here that is ens to ensure that uh, uh, they don't you know, suffer you know, um, greatly.
Okay, all right. And um, now finally, uh, taking a look at uh, the state of the economy, there has been several interventions, especially when the government announced the, the tax measures, uh, talking about uh, working with the private sector to come up with kitties here and there. In the long run, what is that sustainable plan that the government is looking at? Because the way it looks, as long as the numbers keep rising, then the curfew will continue to be extended and therefore affecting businesses in this country. No, none of us wants the numbers to keep rising. Indeed, it would be the, in the interest of all of us that uh, these you know, restrictions are lifted you know, as, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. But in order for the restriction to be lifted, there are certain one or two things that people must do, really. Because you don't want the economy to, um, sorry, everything to be open, and then you have such large numbers mm -hmm. that will eventually overrun our health systems. And, and those measures that we, have to, that we have to undertake to be, you know, to provide an environment that would be able to allow everything to go back to normal are the simple basics that we keep on talking about, really. Right. Wash your hands, you know, be able to obey social distancing. Quarantine, stay at home if you can. I'm using the word if you can, stay at home. If you cannot and you go out, wear your face mask, wash your hands, social distancing. Those are the basic and, and the cardinal measures that are important to ensure that within the shortest time possible the economy is, is, is actually open. However, mm -hmm. our economy did not close down completely, totally. It did not close down. We never went into a complete lockdown. And indeed, even as we suspended the international flights, we mm -hmm. still allowed cargo flights, we allowed cargo vessels. So a large part of the economy is still operating, but we do understand that because our economy is largely service-oriented, the moment tourism is affected, then it also has got other, you know, multiply effects on other areas as well. Right. So what we are really seeing is because of uh, suspension of, of uh, international flights, which affects now other aspects of our economy. But mm -hmm. we are confident that... Uh, as soon as we open up, things will be able to pick up, but we must only open up when our, our curve right. uh, is, 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 is flattened enough. Uh, spokesperson, let, let's conclude with the question about education because, of course, we've seen the invitation by the uh, National COVID-19 Education Response Committee calling on members of the public to submit their submissions or to submit their memoranda to the committee by the 22nd of May on their suggestions on various issues. But there are people that have been asking, is there a possibility to reopen schools as uh, the cases continue to rise? Would it be safe for the learners and even the teachers? I, I, I... The Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Education was very clear that there is a committee that is looking into that. But you also need to mention mm -hmm. that, you see, once life is lost, you can never recover that life. But education can always be reworked out, but it mm -hmm. can never be able to recover life that is lost. And therefore, even as you think about reopening the school, what must be at the foremost of our thought is the well-being and the health of our children. Even as we look at when the school should open, when the school should not open, is that the priority, you know, a focus and consideration should mm -hmm. be the health of our children. And that will be very clear about that, and I don't think that has changed. So even as we look at when to open, we must also look at how are these interventions that we put in place, and as far as COVID is concerned, are panning out, right? If they are panning out, in the manner suggests that the curve is flattening, we are obeying those social distancing rules, we are washing our hands, we are, you know, um, putting on masks, and mm -hmm. certainly that committee will be able to come with a favorable decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much, um, Government Spokesperson Sarah Zoguna, for speaking to us this morning. Um, thank you and have a good day. Up next, we'll be speaking about uh, some of the matters that we know about education. What's the latest? We'll be looking at that shortly after, but first, we take a short break.